John, you cracked me up earlier today when you said, you know, people don't think big companies do good things. We just need to tell them all we're good people. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried that, uh, like you have, didn't work so much. Uh, <laughs> Never give up, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, we can use scale individually and collectively to make a difference. And we had a good discussion today about, about customers and what we wish they knew. Right. Maybe we talk a little bit about that, because um, these are customers as well as associates, and they have families, and yeah. they'll help carry the message. What do we wish people knew about GMOs or sustainable farming or fertilizers? Let me, let me take you. This is one of the challenges that we have. Right? I mean, we, we have a commitment as a company to work with 500,000 farmers on climate-smart agricultural practices. Great commitment, but it's, it's a statistic. And so you put a human face on that, it doesn't resonate with consumers. But when you spend a day with a farmer, it changes your perspective on this opportunity. Because every, one of the, every farmer I've ever met deeply loves and is connected to, to his or her soil, farm. It is an important part of who they are. And so our opportunity here is to bring to life what we do in the agricultural system on a very personal basis. These are real people making real food for real consumers. And I think we're going, to, we're going to keep dramatizing that and making that a reality for people. People talk about big ag. I can't find big ag. You go back on these farms, there are a bunch of farmers doing the best they can to make a difference. I think we, are tell, we have an opportunity to tell that story more effectively. Mm -hmm. so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, over the last couple of days, what I've been uh, interested to hear from people uh, at, at these forums is the level of, in, of interest from business. I want to do is give you a sense of three reasons why uh, working on carbon neutrality, sustainability, addressing climate change is absolutely essential for the Keller Company. The first one is fairly straightforward, it's in our DNA. Mr. Kellogg was one of the great philanthropists of his generation, gave all of his wealth away, created the Kellogg Foundation, they're still one of the largest charities in the world and the single largest shareholder of the Kellogg Company. And that foundation continues to give away about $400 million a year to children's education and health care around the world. That is still very much in the DNA of the Kellogg Company. But importantly, the second reason why it's absolutely business essential for us is because consumers absolutely care about their food, about where it's grown, about ensuring that we are following the right practices to create a sustainable environment, a, con a sustainable platform for feeding what is a growing population in the future. Consumers want to know where their food come from, comes from and what happens to it. And then the third reason is a concern about the state of our supply chain, of our food supply chain. It is a fragile supply chain. One or two weather shocks within this supply chain could very easily not just dramatically increase the price of grains, but make the transfer of grains across national borders extremely difficult. We've seen it happen already a few years ago when Egypt closed its borders due to food riots and they did not allow the, tr the exportation of rice anymore. A company like Kellogg's, we were, make, we, were, we were making Rice Krispies in Europe with that rice from Egypt. So three obvious reasons for why we're absolutely committed to making progress in this, in this space. Several years ago, uh, we would have had all the commitments you expect of the Kellogg company around greenhouse gas, water, waste, etc within the four walls of our plants. And today we still have those very aggressive goals. We recently announced a new set of goals for 2020 in that space. What we also have is we've taken an end-to-end -end responsibility for our supply chain, from the farm all the way to the breakfast table. And in that context, we're also setting ourselves aggressive goals, which we'll, which we'll announce tomorrow, related to the, the two degrees science. Within that, we've committed to working with half a million farmers around the world to adapt climate-smart agriculture. Obviously, that will first improve the livelihoods of those farmers, but also improve their yields and ensure that they're following practices that looks after biodiversity of the soil and the health of the, health of the land. In that context, we have a number of programs around the world, whether it be working with farm growers in India, sorry, corn growers in India to plant alternative crops between the rows of corn so they improve the productivity of the corn by as much as 20% and provide another cash crop and improve the biodiversity of the soil. Or whether it be quinoa growers in the upper Andes in Bolivia, where we, work, where we send agronomists to work with the quinoa growers to improve the productivity, the soil health, 
and provide solar power to those farmers so they can have access to electricity, so both they can check on the prices of their crops and their, and their uh, family can, uh, can study, their children can study at night and improve their education. We also recognize as a company that when a climate shock occurs, and there will be droughts and floods in the future, that it will impact most those who have the least resources to overcome that impact. And so we have a program as a company called Breakfast for Better Days, where we're focused on giving a billion servings away by 2016. We've actually already exceeded that goal within the half the time we set ourselves, and we'll continue to make progress in that area. So uh, the leaders have to walk the talk, have to have compensation, you have to measure it, and then uh, we, have to, we have to engage our employee workforce. So we have employee resource groups. I really like the name business resource groups. That's something to think about, just in terms of saying, hey, this is, this is here for a reason. Uh, but what it enables us to do is to engage and unlock the passion that our employees have, because our employees want to work in a diverse and inclusive organization. So we have uh, several leaders of our ERGs here today. I think we have a, a good number of, uh, of Kellogg people uh, in the room today. And these are all leaders of our, th these are all people who have day jobs and they're demonstrating their leadership abilities by standing up and saying, I want to make a difference in this company and are doing a tremendous job. So thank you very much for all the great work that you do in making the Kellogg company even, even stronger over time. Now, a lot of that is getting at why diversity and inclusion is a good thing and how we're going to make it a reality. It's all very intellectually oriented, okay? It's important for our business. We're going to measure you, we're going to track you, we're going to compensate you based on it. But there's more to making diversity and inclusion come alive than just the intellectual side. It's about getting the hearts and souls of people as well. So how do we get the emotional piece working? And uh, this is a bit where diversity and inclusion is like a brand. Every company has symbols. In our case, the Kellogg Company, one of the strongest symbols we have is the founder, Mr. Kellogg. So the more we can tie diversity and inclusion as one of the key, key mandates of our founder, the reason this company was founded in the first place and the core beliefs of our founder, the easier it is for it to resonate with people as to why diversity and inclusion is important beyond just the importance of us winning as a company. The other one is we've built diversity and inclusion into the core of the values of our company. We have a list of, core, of, of key values. Uh, one of them is, is um, uh, humility and hunger to learn which is why I'm here today in terms of learning from, from others. Another is treating people with respect, which is where, where a lot of the diversity and inclusion sub-values then, then fall within that. So we use the symbols of the company to help drive our diversity and inclusion story within the company. What do you need to know and learn about your customers in order for that to happen? All sorts of things. I mean, it, it's, it's endless. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you just a, a couple of examples. Uh, uh, if you were to look at the breakfast cereal category in Mexico, 30% of all cereal is consumed at the dinner occasion. So when you then come to the United States and you think about Latinos, there's the fourth meal aspect in the evening, and again, you're seeing good cereal consumption at that fourth meal occasion. That's just one example. You come back to then young people, you look at the, uh, the use of media today and mobile technology and, and so on. There is so much that we don't know about our consumer. Our consumer is changing so quickly that as a company, one of our obligations is to continue to redefine our categories based upon how consumers use our category. So historically, we would have defined our cereal business as something that you consume first thing in the morning with a bowl with a spoon and cold milk and sit at your breakfast table. Uh, now it's, okay, people don't have time for that. They're skipping breakfast. So how do you provide the benefits of cereal in a different food format? And that could be breakfast bars and so on. So we have to constantly change our products to meet the needs of consumers. And the balkanization of the US, or the, diversi the diversity in the US consumer and how people eat these days and the snacking and so on is such that the rate of change is faster than we've ever seen in the past. And there is a premium on being nimble, on being quick. And to do that, you've got to have people who will challenge the organization and say, I know you've been doing it this way for 100 years. We're going to do it a completely different way going forward. So we have that, that, that commitment and that belief. It, it both makes business sense as well as simply the right thing to do. So how do we approach it at Kellogg? We approach it the same way we do any other business critical initiative. It doesn't matter whether it's innovation, whether it's brand building, whether it's creating a great 
new product launch, we approach diversity and inclusion using exactly the same tools and techniques. I'm going to go through three or four of them here for you. One is senior executives have to walk the talk. Organizations are incredibly good at sensing when senior executives say one thing and do something different. Our approach to this is you are what you do, not what you say. And so in our case, we had the senior executives on our Executive, and Di Di Executive Diversity and Inclusion Council, EDIC. I chair the EDIC. Uh, my, my key operating direct reports are all the members of our EDIC Council. That group meets on a regular basis, reviews our progress against key metrics and measures, uh, has uh, some uh, discussions with the ERG leads, uh, as well as really talking to our Head of Diversity and Inclusion, Mark King, who's here with, with, with us here today, about what barriers are there in the organization? What can we do to help overcome those barriers? So why, why am I so committed to diversity and inclusion? Really two reasons. First, because I want to win. And diversity and inclusion is critical to the success of this company. We are a branded consumer goods company. We serve the consumers around the world. If you look inside the United States, we have to have an employee base who can understand those consumers. And the shape of those consumers, the face of those consumers are changing every year. The growth is in uh, Latinos, the growth is in African Americans, uh, the nuclear family is changing, the way young people use media is changing. We're in a massively changing environment out there. We need a workforce that reflects that, that understands that at a very basic level. And one of the reasons for that is because we are a branded food company. And for us, it's not just about making great food that tastes good. It's about making people feel good about eating the food. And to do that, you've got to build a brand and you've got to tap into the emotions of those individuals. And to do that, you've really got to understand your consumers at a very deep level. So again, we look at diversity and inclusion within our organization as an absolute critical business necessity. In addition to that, we have one of the most, the highest educated and most diverse workforces in our history of 100 years. How do we ensure that every day those people come to work and give their best so that we can give our best to our consumers? So that's another one of our goals in terms of diversity and inclusion to ensure everyone has the opportunity to contribute to the, to, to the maximum ability that they can. And then finally, it's simply the right thing to do. I'm very fortunate I have the opportunity to travel around the world have breakfast at 6 a.m. in consumers' homes, whether it's in Bogota, Sao Paulo, Michigan, or whether it's in Manchester or Sydney. Uh, and there's one thing that comes through all, every time you sit down at the breakfast table and you ask the parents, what do you want from the future? It's, I want my children to have the opportunities I did not have. And that's, that's true whether you're in Sao Paulo or whether you're in the United States. And as a father of six children, that resonates deeply with me as, as we think about we're a 100-year-old company, as a Kellogg company. We're not just trying to create the future, not just tr trying to create a more diverse inclusive today, we're trying to create a better future for the organization as well. 